Let's give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you for those kind words. It's uh, it's it's really interesting. Uh, <coughs> I've been in insurance, like uh, Mark says, since 1975. And in all those years, I've never met anybody who actually went to college to learn insurance. Mm -hmm. Everybody seems to get into it by accident. And... Uh, and so that that that's that's curious to me. I, I have to tell you, it's it's sure a lot different standing here than sitting back there. For those of you who've done that, uh, this is sort of sort of weird. It kind of reminds me of the story of uh, the Christians and the Romans. And uh, this particular Saturday, uh, the soldiers were bringing in a Christian for the entertainment, and uh, in the Colosseum, and they brought him in and put him in the middle of the arena, and then gave him the bad news he was going to fight a, a lion, but they were all out of spears and knives, so he'd have to do it by hand. And so they brought the lion in and put a cage right next to him, and, and they said, anything you'd like to do before the fight? And he said, yeah, I'd like to just check the lion out first. So, yes? Certainly. So he went over to look at the lion, and he said, okay, I've looked at the lion. They picked the cage up, and the lion ran to the nearest exit. And they said, wow, that's outrageous. How did, what did you do? He said, well, I leaned over and whispered in his ear, there's a speaker after lunch. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so um, we, have, we have a couple other staff members here, Sherry, Lori, Pam, and they take care of the not Lori, uh, Naomi, take care of our benefits and property casualty. We've been asked not to talk about the uh, uh, Affordable Care Act. Uh, it would make the meeting too long. Um, so really, uh, we talk a little bit about the, oh, I have to move this forward. What's that for? There you go. To go between the slides. Button, makes it to go to the next one. Oh, okay. I was using, okay. Um, talk a little bit about how insurance got started. Um, why do you need insurance? Um, how do I get it? How do I know I'm getting something I need? And then what are the new insurances? Um, most of you think of insurance as starting at Lloyd's. And that, it took a big step at Lloyd's, but really started back in the Phoenicians when they were sending ships here, there, and everywhere. The captains would all get together and say, look, we've got a number of ships here, and if one of us has a loss, we ought to share between us the loss. And so what insurance is really all about is to protect you from a financial loss that you cannot afford yourself. So you're getting somebody else to step in, pool you with like people, so you all share in the loss. So the, the key it, the part of that is, is people say, how much insurance do I need? And it kind of depends on a number of things. But the first thing it depends on is, how much risk can you afford to take? Because every dollar you put into an insurance company, you're liable to get 70 or 80 cents back. So if you've got a $100,000 car and you can afford to replace it if it gets destroyed, don't buy insurance, that, generally speaking. Um, so Lloyd's is not an insurance company. Lloyd's actually is a coffee house. And the people that work there are still called waiters. And so they have little cubicles, and syndicates sit in these cubicles, and, and then clerks come around and say, here is a, law, a risk. Would you like to participate in it? So a, a little, little unknown fact. You know when you watch a baseball game and people go to the bullpen and you say, how did the bullpen get its name? You know, nobody quite knows. but. If you're uh, chatting up a young lady at a party and you need some, you can talk to her about, do you know where underwriters got their name? So the people at Lloyd's, they have this kind of a leather case. They put the risk in that describes the case. And they go to an underwriter and say, 
do you want to participate in this? So the people in these booths will look at it and say, okay, you want to insure, as an example, a uh, $100,000 piano for fire. And okay, uh, so I can, I'll insure half of it because I can put up $50,000. And the cost of that would be $500, so it's 1%. So that person kind of sets the rate, examines the, the risk, and underwrites, I'll take this much for this cost. And that person is known as the lead underwriter. And then the job of the broker is to go around and see which pals of the lead underwriter want to sign on for the additional risk. So when the underwriting all adds up to 100%, they say the slip is full, the risk is covered. So that's, that's basically how, how uh, the insurance kind of got started at Lloyd's going around placing risk. Then um, insurance companies started, private insurance companies. Lloyd's is still a major player, and so you have to look at what they're doing because they kind of set the tone for what, 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 what others do. So why do startups need insurance? Um, well, you want to protect yourself from financial risk that you can't handle yourself. And the big thing is, first thing you go and you've got this great idea and you go, you lease an office. And the landlord says, uh, you've got to have insurance. Why do I need insurance for your office? Because if one of your clients or you are in his office or her office and you slip and fall, they don't want their insurance paying for it because that will affect their insurance rates. They want your insurance to pay for it. So contractually you need that. Sometimes your customers will require that you have a certain level of E&O insurance. So you have to buy it if you want that contract. Uh, legally you have to have certain insurances like workers compensation. So you legally you have to protect your workers. There are provisions to self-insure if you've got tons of money but we don't want to go there. You need to buy the insurance. And don't try and con yourself out of it by saying, well, they're really 1099 people, they're not W-2s. Because the law determines who's 1099 and who's W-2s, not what you say. And so if you try and put people in a 1099 and they don't belong there, you could be hanging yourself out to dry. And then the, the last one, uh, the third one, is kind of psychological. I mean, some people say, I've got to have insurance or I just can't sleep at night because I'm worried about what might happen. So, how do you, how do you get insurance? Um, how many of you have ever purchased insurance? Raise your hand. Good. So you know something about this. How many have ever filed a claim? Oh, not as friendly as I thought. <laughs> um, so there are two intermediaries to get your insurance coverage. One's a broker and one's an agent. And there's a huge difference between the two. A broker legally is responsible to the client, which is you. An agent's responsible to the company for whom he's an agent. So if you, have, you need coverage, we suggest you go to a broker first. A broker can go to a number of different companies, find out what's the best deal for you, present you with three or four, explain the differences, and then you can decide what you want, and then they can place it with the company that they have a contract with to provide insurance. An agent would be State Farm, AAA. The, the minus is they can only place your insurance with their company. The plus is if you need insurance like right now, they can say, okay, you're approved. And this, a broker can't do that. A broker's got to go to the company and get their approval and come back. So if you need something right now, yet you really have to go to an agent to get it placed quickly. Um, and then there are a couple, a lot of different kinds of insurance companies, but they're all licensed 
through, through the various state insurance departments. And they have two broad ranges of, of, of companies. They have what's called admitted companies and non-admitted companies. So if you're an admitted company and you want to provide coverage, you have to take your insurance form, the rates you want to charge, go to the commissioner and say, will you approve this? They approve it, then you can sell it. A non-admitted company is licensed to do business in the state, but doesn't go through that process, and they can set whatever rates they want and provide whatever form they want. And one of the ones you know, it, Lloyd's of London, is not admitted. So if you've got a normal coverage, a normal kind of risk, you want to go to an admitted carrier, and the forms are generally all the same, and then it's sort of a matter of price. One of the things you want to be careful of, if, if somebody comes into you and says, I'm a broker and I can get you the best deal in town, as we would say in the sewage business, uh, they're full of compost because the, the insurance companies have to get the rates approved from the commissioner. Every broker that goes to that insurance company for the same risk is going to get the same rate. So be careful when somebody says that, that you should raise a flag. Um, I forgot to move the slide forward. No, I didn't. Um, so I think that covers my, in oh, um, when you do get a quote, how do you know uh, the, the company, whether they're good or not. Or, and, and Best is an independent company that ranks insurance companies. And they have two rankings. One is a financial strength, and then, then one is the way they operate. And, and the companies actually go to Best, and it's kind of like an audit, but they go to Best and, and answer questions. And so the highest ranking they can get is, is A+. Plus. They go A plus to D, and financial, they go from 15 down to 1. So we like, in our business, we like to get a carrier that's at least rated B plus and at least ranked seven on, uh, on the financial strength. So if you've got somebody that's a C3 or you don't want to, they're, they're um, not as strong as you'd like them to be. And then they also rank with the outlook. So if, if somebody's gone from an A to an A minus to a B plus to a B, then they would consider them uh, not necessarily stable, um, so you, you want you want the outlook stable or better. Um, so now I, I'll turn you over to the guy that really knows all about this, my my older brother Chris, and he'll talk to you about the various types of insurance. Okay, so we're going to get not too technical but we'll over. I want to accomplish some of the coverages that you might be asked for from a customer, what you want to have for yourself, how do you avoid a loss, and, and you know, with a policy or something else. So the risk management um, options are when you have your business and you're thinking, this is a product I want to put out, or this is a service I want to go into, et cetera, um, you have risk management options. You want to identify uh, the risk, you want to assess and calculate it, and then prioritize the risk. And there are four options when you're going through um, addressing the risk. You can avoid the risk. So I'm not going to get into dynamite manufacturing. I think that's a little bit too risky, so I'm going to start go somewhere else. Um, you can reduce, reduce the risk, um, which is I'm going to still manufacture fireworks, but I'm going to put sprinklers in the building. Or I might outsource the manufacturing altogether and just sell them with my company. Um, there's transfer the risk, which we're going to talk about after the slide, which is insurance. I'm transferring this risk over to an insurance company who's going to step in, pay any claims, pay to defend me, and keep me up and running. And then there's risk retention, which is not the best option, but it is an option, which is self-insured. You have enough funds to take care of any lawsuits that may come about, um, so I'm going to take that loss on and see how that works out. Not very well most of the time, but that is an option. <coughs> So, general liability. 
Everybody's heard of general liability, right? Yes? Hey, Chris, um, risk management is very dear to my heart, having been in aerospace. Mm -hmm. So there's the opposite side of risk, which is opportunity, right? right. Are there any um, ways that you can take advantage of opportunities with insurance? What would be an example? I don't know. I'm, I'm asking. Like finding a niche that, or um, you know, um, like like risk reduction. You basically you spend money in order to mitigate a risk. Mm -hmm. Opportunity harvesting, as we used to call it. You spend money to go after an opportunity. So I'm just wondering if insurance even looks at the other side of the risk coin. There, there are a number of firms that get involved in risk management, and a lot of times it's really. Uh, cost-effective to have them come through and do a study to reduce your risk. A good example of that would be workers' comp, where people put on tailgate meetings and that sort of thing to reduce the risk. So the effect is the... the but it's always the on, the risk, on the risk side, not on the opportunity side. Yeah. As far as we're concerned. I, I, I can concerned. complete on your, on your question um, and very related to what you mentioned. In fact, it's not a, a risk assessment, you know, to to really understand the situation. You have to deal with assessors, and the assessors, they don't have that much experience. Opportunity comes when somebody realizes <coughs> that there is too much, let's say, insurance, or the risk was overestimated. Mm -hmm. Or assessors, I, I haven't seen one who would be able to do that. Usually people who really know the, the details of the work you want to get into, or the, the, the technology, or the product, or the market, right. um, they know. The assessors don't know, and I think you want to exploit this, this gap. And my experience so far is quite bad, because most of the assessors from these companies, they are trained here, you know, to be very conservative, and they will do everything to <coughs> Uh, you know, not allow you to take the opportunity by paying less well, without risk. spend too much time, I work a lot with, with the self-insured pools and the risk management people that we use are not affiliated with any company because you're self-insured. Mm -hmm. And so they come in and, and their whole job is to, is to reduce the risk. They have. The interest they have is re reducing your losses. Because that's what you end up paying for those losses. So they're trying to reduce the loss. I, I really, don't quite understand your question, but yeah, maybe we can talk about that. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Um, Opportunity is the other side of the risk coin. Right. Yes, maybe I could expand on those questions. Um, I could relate the situation. If a person obtains a term insurance, let's say a term life insurance, where you pay, let's say, up to the uh, next 12 months, and after payment, let's say, you don't pay anything. How about if you have a life insurance that's universal or whatever, that you're making money, you know, a little bit out of that? We're, we're not, we're not going to talk about that. Sorry, I'm sorry to cut you it's off. It's okay. I'm just, I'm trying to. Of it, we're, and yes. Health and life, yeah, that's a whole different issue. Yeah. We're asked not to. I'm just simply trying to correlate the risk yeah. and opportunity. Because it's, if you look at on the side of the uh, insurance is, issuer, it's an opportunity for them. But for us who are paying, you know, in compensation of the risk, we're the one giving them the money. Right. And so we don't get involved in that as well, <laughs> right, right. obviously. Um, what we do help you with is finding a policy or coming up with a plan to band-aid that risk and make sure that you don't have a financial hiccup that you can't afford, as Ron was talking about. Um, so general liability. Most people have probably heard about that. <coughs> Or you've been requested in a contract with a, <coughs> oh, excuse me, there we go, with a um, potential customer, or you sign a lease with a, an office building for a suite, and they ask you for that coverage. So what does general liability really do? At the core, it, it covers tangible loss. So bodily injury or property damage that arises from your product or your premises. So um, it covers those claims as well as uh, defense costs are included in that uh, limit. Um, so a classic um, example for a premises liability is slip and fall. You have a client come on premises, there's uh, water in the hallway or they slip in something, hurt themselves, twist their ankle, this policy would step in and take care of that. Um, then the product, um, you know I always see those kids with the uh, 
shoes that have the little rollers underneath. You know how they can kind of zip along? I'm thinking who in their right yeah. mind would ensure that? And that's <laughs> problems all of my daughter's never gonna have those because I can't deal with that kind of risk. Um, so I'm gonna transfer that. Um, so, and then also, aside from bodily injury and property damage, there is advertising and personal injury coverage. We call that hurt feelings coverage. You slander me, libel, um, what else do we have? Disparagement. Um, who is the classic case of the advertising uh, injury? The, the company, the coffee? You know, the, the tool out there. Oh, yeah. so, uh, they said something like, even the Vanderbilts um, enjoy drinking Sanka coffee. And the Vanderbilt said, hey, you can't use our name in this advertisement. We didn't say you could do that. So that's what that's intended to be covered. Michael Jordan just has a suit in the news today about that. Um, okay, yeah. Where uh, some grocery store used his right. picture and, and number right. to advertise without his permission. You better email MJ and make sure you can use his likelihood yeah. in the advertisement. Um, but if a claim were to arise from that, then a liability would step in. Um, the other piece is tenant legal liability. So you're in your suite uh, and you left a, uh, a light on or there's something plugged into the wall, causes a fire. You have a liability to the tenant to the other to the building owner as well as the other tenants if they were to have some property damage from that um, fire. So that's also included in general liability. And then the last piece is medical expense, and we call that goodwill coverage. So the situation where the person slipped and fell, you say, hey, go go to the doctor, get that bandage up, or have an X-ray, take uh, take a look take a look at it, and let's get that handled right now. So it doesn't escalate into something bigger. So it's kind of just to get it taken care of. Um, in defense costs, uh, legal expenses are included in the general liability. It's generally part of the limit. Um, most of our clients have a one million per occurrence, two million in the aggregate. In an aggregate, it's basically a basket limit for the year, and the per occurrence is one claim can go up to that. Limit. Are any companies writing patent infringement? Yes, but it's terribly expensive. I understand. Um, but there are, and that's a specialty like the Lloyds, or AIG. Well, that's on a slide. Um, the next thing is, as a startup, you probably have some property in this new office suite that you run it. So um, you'll want to cover that as well. Now, most carriers can package this with the liability and the property. Um, so what it covers is uh, claims of, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not keeping up on that. Um, this works Intended to cover claims of damage to property you own, you rent, or you lease. So, if you, oh, okay. um, so property you own is, is pretty explanatory. Um, if you lease a uh, new copy machine, you know you want to make sure that's covered because you, um, you know, if, some, if you were uh, if you found liable for the damage to it, this would uh, the, or the damage the property would uh, cover that loss. Um, there are three coverage forms. There's basic, which is really not much, all the way up to special. Uh, and special is basically everything is covered aside, aside from earthquake and flood. Those are two coverages that are uh, specialty coverages and are written by specialty carriers, not included in basic property or special property forms. In the valuation, there are two valuation types. There's actual cash value or replacement cost. We want generally put it on a replacement cost basis because that takes into uh, consideration depreciation. So you don't, the actual cash value won't get you as much. If you want something new, something that um, you know, will work as well as the uh, property you had before, computers for instance. Um, and there is a dollar deductible for, um, that you're responsible for paying. Generally a thousand for a smaller one, you go up to 10, 25, 50,000 that you would be on the hook for. Business income. Um, it covers loss of income or profits and any extra expense associated with a covered loss of covered location. So if you had a fire and your operations are down, you're not going to be manufacturing or working uh, or be able to turn out any product. Uh, so this business income supplements that loss of income and any extra expense such as additional um, payroll or employees to um, hire employees to uh, get operations back and going, up and running, excuse me, um, or equipment, 
um, stock. Just basically, you want to keep things going. Extra expense um, and business income is the tool to, to uh, make that happen. There is a waiting period deductible. So in, unlike in business personal property where it's a dollar deductible, there's a waiting period usually with business income, anywhere from 20 to 7, 24 to 72 hours until the insurance kicks in. So that gives you time to kind of get things up and going, and then the insurance will kick in. Um, we talk about extra expense? Yes, okay. And then there's a third, which is contingent business income. So if you're working with a third party, you outsource maybe the manufacturing of the Dynamite to another company, and they have a loss that's covered, contingent business income would uh, step in and supplement that loss of income because you had a third party at a critical, um, a critical third party at a, a loss. Does that make sense? Okay. And again, the major exclusions are earthquake and flood, which are covered separately. Business auto, um, let me get moving on this. Business auto uh, basically mirrors your personal auto, but the uh, policy is in the name of the company. Okay, so ABC Company has an auto policy for owned vehicles. If the company owns autos, it's in the company name. We have a fleet of vehicles, for example. Um, Non-owned vehicles means I'm going to a client in my own vehicle and I have an accident. My personal insurance would be primary, but then this uh, non-owned auto would kick in as excess in case I only have the 30, 15, you know, the minimal limits on a, uh, my auto policy. We always recommend that um, clients ask for copies of their employee's insurance and make sure that the limits are adequate. So that they take you know, their policies at first and this is secondary. Uh, and then hired autos are rental vehicles. So you're going out of town on business, you rent a vehicle, that's the third component of the uh, auto coverage. The additional lot liability coverages, the pretty much bodily injury, property damage, comp and collision, med pay, it basically mirrors what your personal auto has. And of course, uninsured and underinsured, if uh, although you're supposed to have auto insurance, if somebody doesn't, you're in an accident with them and they can't pay for the damage, uh, this would step in and, and supplement that coverage or lack of coverage by the third party. Work comp. Contractually, as Ron said, if you have one employee, you need to have this coverage, state mandated. Um, you can go, if you're a new company, California State Fund is probably gonna be your best bet. They're kind of the market of last resort because they take on new entities or somebody working in the dynamite uh, facility, manufacturing facility we spoke of. Not a real desirable, 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 desirable thank you, <laughs> to pass risk. So California State Fund takes on those uh, type of risks. Um, the policy pays um, medical, disability, rehabilitation, death benefits, lost wages to the employee who was hurt. Uh, the rates are, uh, per class code, are filed with the California Department of Insurance, but they can vary from carrier to carrier, as Ron said. They are determined by a number of factors, such as gross payroll for all the employees, uh, what industry classification in the valley. We have a lot of software um, uh, engineers, so that's 8859 is that class. 8810 is clerical for employees who are staying in the office, don't really go out. Uh, 8742 is for outside salespeople who are out in the field. So the, the risks are a little varied by what your uh, employees are doing. Um, and the payroll is auditable at the end of the policy period, and the premiums adjusted accordingly. So we tell our newer clients who don't know what their payroll is going to be throughout the year, be conservatively realistic. It's going to be audited at the end, but you don't want to put all that money out of pocket uh, initially. So leave that in your pocket. If you do hire 10 people, great, but the uh, insurance company, company is going to come, after, not after you, but it's going to ask for your actual payrolls for the year, and then they'll true it up and charge you an additional premium if there is additional exposure. Next. Okay, professional liability or E&O coverage. We've all heard of that, correct? Okay. Um, so professional liability covers the intangible loss, financial loss by a third party due to uh, the lack of performance of uh, your product, or your heir and your professional responsibilities or professional duties. Um, like I said, it covers financial loss uh, as opposed to the general liability, which is a tangible loss to bodily injury or property damage. 
Um, for example, you know, a would cover an accounting firm for an error in their rendering of tax returns for a client. Note, that would never happen at ASL. <laughs> but if it did, um, the policy would step in, um, excuse me, step in and pay for any, it pays for, even if the claim was fraudulent uh, or not without merit, the defense costs are included in there. So you're not, legal expenses are through the roof, as some of you may know, so that steps in and pays legal expenses, as well as any uh, judgments or, or settlement costs for a claim. Yeah, the uh, biggest cost in this coverage usually is, are the legal costs, because anybody can sue you for anything. We recommend starting um, a limit, a minimum of a million per claim or in, in, in the aggregate, and there is generally a deductible of $1,000 or higher. So you're, you have a little skin in the game. Um, and it's written on a claims made policy form with a retroactive date. So basically, if you were to start a policy tomorrow, it would uh, be for an annual term and you would have a retroactive date. So you couldn't start a policy and say, oh, by the way, I have a couple um, unhappy customers from last year. I want to tender a claim. No, they, that's a, uh, date and time when they start the coverage and then it goes forward. So the claim has to have occurred after the retroactive date and then reported after the retroactive date. Um, and there are various endorsements and exclusions on each policy. Different carriers like different risks. They have different policy forms. I could talk for hours about that, but just it's best to uh, consult your broker. Question. Chris, question. Yes. So on that E&O, would a software company who has an app, let's say, mm -hmm. Would, would you recommend that as a product, as this app? I mean, is there, could, could that hurt anybody? Do they really need that? They do need it. But what happens usually is the customer or the person you're working with mandates the coverage. So I really don't have to explain, you know, why they need it. The contractually, they have to have it. Um, but if the app doesn't perform as intended, or... Are you talking about like somebody puts an app on the app store, a bunch of consumers go out and get it, and, and well, it doesn't do something that you see it Right, because it's third party. Yeah, yeah, if you had an app, you, this is, we have entrepreneurs here who started, and I'm wondering how, you know, do they really need E&O insurance if it's not really a, a service provider? Like, we're a CPA firm, we have to have E&O insurance. Right. It's obvious, right? Mm -hmm. But would someone in this room who has a software company or a, uh, you know, a, an internet-based company, right. something that's not really service-oriented, would they, should they have E&O insurance? Yes, um, and you make representations and warranties that your software is going to do a certain thing for you for the third party. If it doesn't, that's when the E&O would set them. Yeah, but usually there's these huge disclaimers. I've never seen a software package that doesn't have like <laughs> 10 pages of disclaimers that says, we're not liable if this doesn't work yeah, as right. That doesn't matter. Yeah. I mean, the, the real issue is somebody sues you. Okay. You've got to pay for the defense. They'll use that to defend against the claim, but you still got, you still, you still got the lawyer. Right. That, 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 I've done a lot of work in Beth Bell with that. Most, a lot of the money goes for the lawyers. And I just, that, that's what you need to do. Okay. Thank you. Uh, management liability. Um, this is for your D's and O's of the firm. Um, so the, the liability package can have anything from directors and officers liability, employment practices, fiduciary, crime, or kidnap and ransom, or special risk as they call it. Um, so I've got a lot of notes on this, I want to make sure I don't miss anything. Um, so for private firms or startups, which is what we're talking about, DNO isn't really as much of a risk as your employee population, employment practices, for alleged claims of harassment, discrimination due to um, age, sex, race, religion, gender discrimination, more than 75% of the claims for pro or startups or private companies is through the EPL. So that's, well, that's, that's the, what the management liability is really intended to cover, uh, the EPL. Um, but D's and O's, if you're starting a company, you have a board, you want to make sure that, and, and let the, um, Respective board members know that you have DNO, so that their personal uh, assets are not at risk for representing you. Yeah, yeah I was going to say that anybody who knows anything <coughs> in the Valley mm -hmm. would say, I will not be on your board right. unless you have DNO and let me tell, tell me what your mm -hmm. limits mm -hmm. are. And that goes startup, nonprofit, um, any kind of board that you're on, you really should make sure that they have some sort of uh, DNO coverage in place. So can you speak to that uh, specifically, the amount of coverage that you should have as a DNO for DNO when you're a startup? Maybe pre-funding versus 
after the first round? Usually, the D's and O's, the D's have a pretty good idea what they want. And they'll tell you. So that's... There isn't really a, there isn't really a barometer. I mean, um, it's what the comfort level of the firm is with what limit they want to have. Okay. Um, or, as Ron said, what the prospective um, uh, board members will dictate. They will only come on. And, and where they are in the financing, you know, if they just raised $50 million, they're not going to be happy with me. Right. So, so it, it, a lot of things are coming. Okay, thank you. Do you and, uh, some cost estimates <coughs> on some of those? I mean, what is I'm sorry? To get Pardon? Directors and officers liability. Um, for a million dollar limit um, with a reasonable deductible, um, it's in the three to five thousand dollar annual range for a million dollar limit. And that, you know, it's it's all dependent on the risk in the company and how big the board is and how much experience there is. There's a lot of underwriting factors that go into it. But you're looking at a couple thousand dollars to start per member. Yeah. No, for, for the entity. And if you're if you have a board of advisors, yeah, do they also. need DNO also, or whatever it's called? D yeah, DNO. Board of advisors. Um, if they're if they're sitting on the board, is that what you mean? Or some companies will have advisors who aren't directors. You know, who are maybe industry experts. Uh, I haven't run into that. Who are not voted um, on legally into the corporate structure. If I was an advisor, uh, I'm going to refer. If I was an advisor, I think I'd want the company to have that kind of coverage. I would. My presumption is that coverage would be a lot less costly than the director because the risk is less. But I'm, I'm presuming. I don't think. I don't recall we placed that coverage never come up in our, for, for us. For advisors, we have to do those. The board of advisors could be a 1099, not W2. So he carries his own insurance in case, you know. Right. Well, generally, an advisor isn't getting paid anything. Yeah, they may right. be compensated with yeah. stock. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. That's, 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 stock. that's generally yeah. what happens. What you're saying is usually you don't sell insurance for advisors, it's directors and officers. Right, yeah. Yeah, we have, we haven't been asked, I guess. Yeah, that's so the, an advisor would have to make his you know, his own decision or her decision whether you know, she, she or he is covered. Make sure they have a large personal that. umbrella to right. take, you know, to take care of that. The way we'd approach that uh, <coughs> is um, there are what's called wholesale brokers that we go to that specialize in D and O and this kind of coverage, and we'd say, you know, what's your experience? Uh, you know, have you provided coverage for for, uh, for advisors? And if you have, how much is it? What are we looking at? And who covers it? And then go back to the client and say, look, here's what we found out. What do you, What are you comfortable with? Because our position is we want to solve problems, not be labeled as selling insurance. So. So we go and get the information and say, kind of, what do you do? And our experience would be, you know, we haven't, right now, we haven't placed any of that. Yeah, there hasn't so, been that demand. Yeah. Not that we've seen that we've seen. Um, fiduciary liability, anybody who's entrusted with control or authority of, uh, over the management of funds and the administration of a pension or welfare plan of the firm. So that would cover their um, interest in managing that firm, or uh, managing the funds. Crime, employee theft, computer uh, funds and transfer fraud, forgery alteration. Um, that would be first party. You can add third party crime if you have uh, employees at a customer site and that uh, customer alleges that your employee stole from them. That would you could extend that coverage there. Yeah. So what about the event? Say someone hacks someone hacks my server and takes my company's credit card or my client's oh, credit card. We'll get to that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, in terms of the fiduciary liability uh, for administration of pension plan, if I'm a startup and I open a Quran page yeah. or the two three employees, right. um, how much, how is that calculated? That right? Oh, they want to know what number the size of the assets. The size of the assets. Okay. So there's the fiduciary liability, and then ERISA law mandates that you bond 10 percent of the plan assets. Mm -hmm. That's another component of it. Um, and then kidnap and ransom, K&R, they call it our special risk, provides 
um, for um, any costs associated with uh, the kidnapping or extortion of employees, both in the U.S. and overseas. Um, and what you really pay for there is the crisis response that's handled by a third-party company. Kroll is a large one that um, provides that coverage. They have 007s, you know, type of individuals who go in and try and get your um, high-level executive out of a country or that situation. We don't see as much of that, at least with the startups. Two, two additional crime. The sweeter the little old lady you have keeping your books, <laughs> the higher the likelihood you're going to have crime. And, 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 oh, you see that? And, and I don't believe it, but that. And then, uh, and then K and R. A lot, a lot of marketing people here do not go around saying, "And I've got a ten million dollar K and R policy on me," because chances are next week somebody's going to ask ten million dollars for you, and you're going to be in another country. So. Uh, so that's, uh, yeah, we've had a case where um, the finance director set up in California, set up a little account in Florida, and was transferring funds over there. Turns out she had a little gambling and alcohol problem, but um, that's neither here nor there. That was very sweet and old. Yeah, she. <laughs> so you know, you just you, you never know who or who's going to be doing that. Um, then patent infringement. These are. Um, depending on what uh, the startup and the various exposures associated with your firm's product or services, these are additional coverages. So patent infringement or enforcement. Um, so the first one covers if you infringe on somebody else's patent and you have to pay legal fees to you know, get out of that bind. The other is to enforce your um, patent in case somebody infringes, infringes on you. Um, a response we just talked about. General liability does not cover product recall. So if you're Fosters and you put some bad chickens on the uh, in the chiller or on, on display or purchase and there's E. coli or some other issue, um, GL doesn't cover that. So that is a separate part we call a separate uh, uh, um, policy. Pollution liability uh, is another policy that is separate and written um, on its own. And if you have overseas operations, startups maybe not, but as you grow, uh, you'll need to expand the general liability in your package to include um, coverage for general liability claims overseas, uh, as well as international auto, uh, FWCs, foreign workers' compensation, and if, if you have any property overseas. Uh, and then transit marine cargo. Um, again, Lloyd's is the uh, usual uh, carrier to uh, work on your uh, marine or, or ocean cargo. And then inland transit, if you're you know, sending uh, your product out um, and you have an accident or it goes missing or is damaged, that would, would cover your product while it's away from your premises. Um, so as Mark was saying, there's been a lot of uh, regulations uh, mandating that people take care of the information they have. Um, so HIPAA, as I'm sure you all know about, was in, uh, an act in 1996 that addressed the need to protect an individual's personal health information. Um, Graham Leach uh, Biley or the Financial Services Modernization Act required institutions to explain any information sharing practices to their customers. I'm sure you've received in your monthly statement, you know, along the mini Bible of what their uh, procedures, uh, procedures are. And then uh, the Homeland Security Act of 2002 included Federal Information Security Management Act, which said that um, you have to take, you're responsible for the um, the content of the information you have, you need to take measures to protect it. That's kind of open, it doesn't really, but those are the first ones, and then there's been numerous uh, laws and regulations since then that um, discussed how you have to uh, deal with sensitive information. So cyber, as you were talking about, it seems that every night on the news you hear some other company who's been breached. Um, these are the larger ones in 2014 eBay had 145 million records compromised, Home Depot, J.P. Morgan, Target, um, and Community Health Services. Our company insurance is with Anthem. They had a large loss, so we had to get on and you know have our uh, credit monitored for a couple of years with them. Um, and the breaches by industry type, as you can see, medical and healthcare, uh, 110 million records. That's just astronomical. Um, and then I thought bank and credit financial would be a little bit more than uh, 411 records, but Evidently not. Healthcare seems to be the one that gets hit. And people hack, they sell this information in the, on the black market for a lot of money, it seems like. That's why they're doing it. 
and the average breach cost is about 145 per lost record. So you can do the math, 145 times a lot of records that are compromised, that the cost can get pretty, pretty large. So cyber liability, this is the hot new risk that's out there right now. And a lot of startups either don't take payment or credit card information, they don't have social security numbers on file, they don't see it as a threat. I would go to point three and say, if you have a website, which most companies do in the Valley and, and across the US, you have media uh, cyber liability via the media liability. So as I talked about personal advertising injury on the general liability form for Michael Jordan not being, uh, lending his name or giving permission, if you were to put anything on your website um, that a third party could say, I didn't allow you to uh, use my name or likelihood on the website, uh, fringe of copyright or trade dress, invasion of privacy on your website, um, there's cyber liability. So along with the website, I mean, if you have employees, you're keeping social security numbers and a lot of um, personal information on file. Um, you So that's the second bullet, security, security and privacy liability. Um, so your third party, your employee uh, says, hey, my, my credit card number is out there, my social security number is, and somebody's taking on me uh, in another form with this information that's been lost. Um, there's privacy breach expenses, which include you know, your crisis management expense, like with the Anthem, they have to notify us, you have to notify all the customers that it's, there's been a breach. Uh, monitoring services, credit monitoring is part of that expense. Um, and then number four, business interruption and loss of data. If you have a breach and you, you know, there's a loss of income because of that breach, uh, that there would be coverage there as well. And cyber extortion, so if somebody says, hey, I breached your system, I have all these social security numbers, I need 10 million or I'm gonna just let them all go. That's what the last bullet is for. So is this like a rider policy or an addition? Because it this, seems like you're kind of cr crossing hairs here with some of the other insurances. So, some of the general liability policies will add a cyber liability <coughs> endorsement that will give you yeah. a little bit of coverage. For example, if you're in a CPA, a Cameco, um, October 1 is going to add $250,000 coverage for cyber liability. Our feeling is that's not enough for the large firms because the notification costs are about $20 per each and you can, you know, you can go through a half a million dollars pretty quickly, $20 each. So, um, so this, is, this is a standalone policy. The nice part about it is there's a group in New York that you go to if you think you've got a problem and they lead you through, here's what we're going to do for you and here's what you need to do. Because the first thing people say is, God, it's been breached, what do I do now? So there's a number to call and get some, some good advice. But what you need to do is, is to check your current <coughs> other policies to see what coverage you have under that policy and see if you need to add something else. So the other ones are primary, and this is an add-on for if you feel like you've got an additional risk to your business. This is a this is a stand. I mean, this is a standalone policy. The other policies will, as Ron said, provide a little bit of coverage. But if you have a real uh, issue breach on your hands, that won't. Sometimes you're going to fight over who takes primary. Yeah. That's all. The other thing, uh, because look, we've been checking this out for ourselves, we have um, we go to this outfit that puts our stuff on a cloud and encrypts it and all that. So I said, well, you know, supposing the cloud gets, what happens? I said, what's the coverage? They said, oh, don't worry. It's a policy. It's $10 million. And I said, well, that's great. Let's say they have a 1,000 clients. That ends up being 100,000 each. And that's what we would call third-party coverage. So we would have to incur all the expense, then file a claim with the cloud company, and hope we get some of it back. So, so well, you don't fall into the trap of thinking the cloud company's got coverage that will take care of you. It, it, it may, but it'll be after you've spent the money and you file a claim to get it back. So it, it, this is complicated, it keeps on changing. It's kind of like Obamacare a year ago, like every month somebody's got something different to it. So.
this is the most comprehensive product that we found to date. And it's still an evolving coverage, so this provides the broadest coverage terms that we could find. I heard a presentation recently from an insurance company regarding cyber liability and the, ex and the example that they used, uh, which happened fairly recently, was that a woman representing a major corporation here in the Valley decided to take her computer home with her for the weekend uh, to do her work. And so she got it set up on her coffee table. She had uh, 250 major clients of this corporation inside, and she was going to do some work there. She put her password next to it so she could get started right away. She secured the house completely and uh, went over to Starbucks to get coffee, came back, someone had broken in and stolen her computer and password as well as looking for money. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, the company sent out a letter to all 250 groups saying, did you ever get compromised and over a six month period, no one had been, but attorneys took up the case anyway and the insurance company settled for several million dollars for a problem that never existed yeah. with that situation. We've heard some really weird old stuff. People situation. throw their copiers away at the trash it, and somebody goes in and get fixed the yeah. discount. You know, with, the, and then uh, there was a hospital that we deal with that uh, they sent uh, a bunch of medical records, um, AS, uh, DSL, or anyway, one of the freight companies. They lost mm -hmm. it. That it was gone, and it was gone for a month. They got it back, but in the meantime, what do they do? Um, yeah. uh, so this thing's a little broader than just you know computers getting stolen, computers yes. getting lost, and, uh, right. people taking issue. stuff home. Yes. It, it, it gets pretty nasty. Yeah, I put a line on the bottom of this that I took out is uh, it's not a question of will you be happy, but when. You know, it's I wish these people who are doing this would spend their time. Uh, Something productive. Chris, we got our 10 minute signal. Five minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing we're in the, in the, the presidential debates. So that was a lot of information um, that we could talk a while about, but that was just oh, 30, yeah, there, there we are. 30,000 foot overview of uh, what companies are. And, uh, yes? Oh, I, I was already for a question. Okay. <laughs> I have a real stupid one. Every time oh, I go to rent a car, you know, you, you, you have all those questions. I stumble over, do I want to insure my rental car with their insurance? And I always say no. How does that relate to the business and personal liability, auto liability insurance? Would you just say it's It depends on how you rent it. If you rent it in your name or the company name, it's probably most likely going to be in your name and your personal auto policy. Most co uh, coverages extend to rental vehicles. That would be primary, and then anything excess that. So why buy it? Yeah, well, be really careful. Uh, how about the, put that person that came from overseas and rented a Ford Shooter? Right. So that, that, there's. Um, and what was the issue there? The, the foreign employee? Yes. Or? Yeah, it was an uh, employee who came over from the Netherlands and yeah. rented a car and cut off a $200,000 car in Monterey. It was during the. Mm -hmm. The car shows there, and um, because they didn't have the provisions of the policy, where you have to have a local license, and he didn't, being from the Netherlands, and so the policy stepped in after the minimum California requirements of 1535. So the insured was on, or the company was on the hook for the first 15,000, and then, and it ended up being a very large claim. So they weren't too disappointed, but um, yeah. You know, roughly, what should a, a startup be budgeting for insurance on an annual basis? I mean, we, we use well, some of the rough 10000 for legal accounting. A regular, uh, uh, what we call a package policy, yeah, right. where you get the liability and a little bit of property. Uh, what's the minimum premium? 450 That's for GL only. But if you yeah. have a package policy, it's usually 750 Yeah. And then per, and that's what per, year. Good per year. Per year. Yeah, they're pretty they can be inexpensive. Now that's based on what you're, you know, it's usually uh, based on revenue. So um, that that's a factor you have to figure in. So if you're, you know, cut a million dollars. Yeah, if you just got ten million funding from somebody, you, you're not going to get the seven fifty But that's the minimum. It obviously goes up from there. And then E and O um, can be a couple thousand dollars again, based on the exposures, the management liability as well. So um, if you wanted the full suite of things we talked about. Um, I'd say between seventy-five and ten thousand dollars at a minimum, 
and then you can chisel that down with reduction in limits. The workers' the comp is your software for one percent of payroll. The workers' comp. Yeah. But you ought to understand that these software guys go down the hall on their skateboards thinking about something else. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, it's the reason we had this seminar is because we hope that startups will look at managing their risk and not ignoring the risk. So, can they come to you and can you help them to say, okay, look, here's the coverages for your company that you really ought to have, and here's what it would cost, and you know, here's here's some other coverages you could have, but. They're pretty expensive, yeah. so that they can decide, well, I can afford that, and I can't afford that, so I'm going to take the risk on that. Let me take can you me, help them with that? Yeah, let me, let me take you through the process. The first thing you ought to decide who you want to work with. Do not go out and get quotes from everyone. Decide who you want to work with, and then work with that firm. Because what happens is, if we send uh, a, an application to a company that say, would you provide a quote? And then X over here sends an application to the same company for the, the they're going to say, wait a minute, who represents this person? We're not going to quote anybody until we find out. So it, it, it holds things up, it really holds them up badly. So first thing, you interview the people, find out who you want to work with, and you ought to really make a commitment that this is a long-term commitment unless this company really screws up because you're going to invest a lot of time in educating them on what you're doing, and why you're doing it, and where you're going to go. So that's that's our that's our. then um, you know we glad to, we talk to a lot of people. We're happy to talk. to It's really fascinating, you know, how people make their money, what they're doing. So, um, but but pick out who you want to work with first, uh, and, and and then go from there. Don't. Go out and get bids and figure you're going to take the lowest bid. It doesn't work. Just it'll probably work. You said that, that the rates come from the commissioner. Right. Anyway. So, and I understand it's a decision. It's a decision process. So it's right. better to work with somebody and, and go through the whole details of right. what you want to do and understand the risk right. and, and, and get Are you a broker? Your, your package. Are you an insurance broker? No, I'm not. Okay. <laughs> uh, but also, I understand the, the new approach, which is more, um, you know, like crowd, uh, crowd intelligence, so like scoring and, and, and statistics. And I guess that's why this idea of, you know, asking for quotes from many, many others, just to see. Well, a good broker is going to get you quotes from, from, from a number of insurance companies and will know. The insurance company, generally speaking, we know the insurance company that's interested in your risk. But there are companies that is quoted by a commissioner. That's no, not no, no, it's quoted by the insurance company. The insurance company gets their rates approved oh, by oh, the commissioner okay. before. Okay. Sorry, yeah. The com they don't go to the commissioner right. for every quote. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So when you're talking with a broker or an agent, <coughs> I mean, or let's say broker, okay. what factors are you looking for? I mean, that will tell you what you are we looking go for? No, what? Well, as a go. consumer. I mean, how do you just, how should I would know that Shepard Insurance are the guys. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, right. Right. No, you want to make Huge <laughs> risk. <laughs> that's, the, that's the big part of risk management. You no, want to make sure that, I mean, uh, the same way you deal with, you when you pick out a tax advisor or a lawyer or, you know, you've got to have somebody you feel comfortable with. In my mind, integrity is really Number one, if you don't trust that person, don't do business with them at all. And we won't take clients we don't trust because it's it found a found reputation. So that that to me is key. Find it. Find somebody you like working with. I mean that you gotta have fun in life. You don't want some miserable goat that you, you know knows a lot about insurance that you don't like working with. <laughs> but aside from that, so, you want to make sure that they have access to all the markets. So yeah. the way we bridge that is we are an affiliate of another company in San Carlos who has access to every market you can imagine. So just because we're a smaller firm, we have the representation that a Marshall or Willis or a larger um, firm would have. And then different brokers specialize in different industries. So like we don't touch construction because that's a hairy animal that is best handled. Every firm I've worked at had its own construction unit. I never got um, any training or, or education in that. 
so we just don't touch that. When you say access to all the markets, which markets are you talking about? Insurance, co insurance, insurance companies. So we have to, because you have to have a partner to work CNA, with them. CNA, AIG, Travelers, okay. ACE, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. This California State Fund, mm -hmm. does it work only with startups or they work with startups? Anybody. Anybody. They work with anybody. They take on the riskier. So if you're a contractor or a roofer, perhaps, um, we have an HVAC contractor as a client that started there. And then when they saw they gained some uh, momentum and had no losses, then we moved them out to travelers because they could see that they were um, taking the right uh, precautions when they were working. So the California State Fund, it's not part of the state of California. It's just a separate it sort of is. is. It sort of is? Yeah. It was established. It was established, but, but from my understanding, it's an independent workers' comp company. I mean, they, they well, the state appoints the directors, oh, you know, so it's, uh, yeah. State and they're, they're not, it's not publicly held. Well, they want to make sure everybody can get workers' comp. Yeah, that's and exactly that's, right. There has to be at least one insurance state. state. Yeah. But and you can go to them. lots of other independent workers' comp companies to get insurance, and in some cases yeah. it's a better rate. State yeah. Yes. The the thing that most companies would like three years loss history, mm -hmm. you can't have that if you start it. Mm -hmm. Right. So you go to the fund. So that's why three years a lot of start. Yes. Okay. Okay. So we we appreciate it. The thing is, manage your risk. Um, every startup, there's some key advisors that you need to have. You know, you need to have a CPA. You need to have an attorney. And you need a banker, you need to get a bank account open, right? You need a banker. And you need an insurance agent, okay? You need to manage your risk. Talk to them. Have them tell you what the common coverages are that startups get and what they would recommend for you. There's nothing wrong with getting a second opinion, you know, but have an insurance, somebody that does that 40 hours a week. You know, don't just go online and wing it. You know, it's really important to manage your risk. Let's give, give these guys a break. Thank you.